then they, they asked him a question, were these pilots uh, human or non-human? And he said, non-human biologics. That's Can crazy. Can you believe that? Blood and, Blood and Go on and yes, guys, and welcome back to episode 23 of the Larger Than, than Life podcast. Um, I can't believe it's episode 23 already. 23. We are really racking them up. And uh, we are still not seeing the, the fruits of our labor. But you know what? <laughs> One day it shall come. Um, no, I'm joking, of course. Guys, thank you for all of the support you continue to give. I know there's only a few of you, but we do really appreciate it. It gives us a bit more reason to be doing this and to stay hopeful. Rory, where um, can they find us, bro? Guys, remember, uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe on YouTube. Please follow us on Spotify. Follow us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you find your podcasts. Uh, and if you want uh, you know, short, that short form content, you can find us on TikTok. You can find us on Instagram at larkerthanlife underscore LTL. Um, but without further ado, Rory, let's get into it. So how do we like to start each episode? Beer of the week time. Woo! Let's go. What have we got this week, Rory? Right. So today we've got a Siren Brewery, a Yulu. Uh, do you know what? I think we've actually reviewed a siren before, and it was um, probably one of the worst beers we've ever actually it was, tried. It was the worst beer we've ever it, tried. It was a beer. coffee one, wasn't it? Yeah, and it yeah, tasted yeah. of um, of nappies. Um, <laughs> so yeah, but without further ado, let's uh, let's jump into this one. Do you know what? I've got a good feeling about this one. The branding, yeah, it's nice yeah, and green, so I think it's it's going to be a good one. Oh, it's actually really cool. Yeah, it's cool. Um, but yeah, let's 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 give it a go. Yeah, also, yeah. The, do you know what? We, we've I've run into a bit of a problem, Sarah. So we we have our um our beer of the week. We we carefully select it from one corner shop down the road from the studio. And uh, today I, I walked in. I was like, "Fuck me! I think we've tried all of these." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so nice. we're running low, right? So you know we need to find either find a new corner shop or we need to start ordering them in. Guys, give us some suggestions for some beers we should yes. try, please. Yeah, we'd love that. Honestly, um, we'd love to start ordering them in. We've ordered one in the uh, what was it called Red Horse from the Philippines. That was amazing. That, that banged. That was good. That was great, but so we'd like to try more. So give us some countries to try. We can find the highest rated beer. But honestly, sorry, just really quickly on the branding. Go on. Do you know what this looks like to me? It looks like if the Green Giant fucked Alice from Alice in Wonderland and they had that. a child. I see that. Do, do you see? I'm getting like Medusa vibes as well. Facts. Yeah, facts, yeah. Facts, facts, facts. I'm telling you, it's cool. But anyways, bro. Let's get into it. Oh God, is it going to fizz? Nice. That was such a nice fizz. I should have done it in the mic. Cheers, mate. Cheers, man. To episode 23. 23. Ooh. So it's kind of fruity. What's this one about, man? So the description for this one is refreshing and exciting in equal measure. Yulu is brewed with Earl Grey tea and lemon zest for taste. That, but, um, that, that's not a word. That belies its strength. Is that a word? Belies? Honestly, I'm working. I don't know. That Belize? Anyway, um, <laughs> distinct peach These and apricot country. notes are, com- are complemented by zesty bergamot flavours uh, and a delicate loose leaf tea bitterness. By what malt? Mate, there are two words in this description I've never seen before in my life. <laughs> Belize and bergamot. That's not a thing. I thought you said bergamot. And I was bergamot. Like... So B-E-R-G-A-M-O-T. Bergamot. I don't know, but it tastes good. It does taste pretty I, good. I like actually. it. It's fruity. That's a good summer bit. I like that. What are you rating that? Maybe one more sip. I think we've had a lot of fruity beers. It feels weak. Do you know it what I mean? Feel it feels like. I think it might be like under four. It might be 3.8, you know. It's 3.6. It, I feel like, yeah, I think the flavor's there, but I don't think it's got that kind of crisp, like. Oh yeah, that's a beer. You know, you know what I mean. You know, oh, you're I like, that's, that's a beer. So I think flavor-wise, it's decent. But I think because it's lacking that, you know, this is a beer vibe. I think I can only give it a six point five. Wow, fair enough. Yeah, what do you think? I think I'm going to agree with you there. Six point five. It's solid. It's a solid. I think it's actually really tasty. Yeah, for the pure purposes of the fact that it's not strong enough, it's almost watery. It is almost watery. Yeah, I'm glad you agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost watery. But yeah, just because it's not like strong enough, basically, I'm just not gonna. I can't rank it higher. Well, I think we've reviewed enough beers now that, like, you know, we we've got to, we're getting harsh now. You know, yeah, yeah. our 6. sample 5. size is bigger, so mm. you know that's the way it goes. So yeah, six point five. We'll whack it on the bear leaderboard on the screen now, and um, you can see how it ranks basically compared to the others. Yeah, but uh, um, but mate, yeah. I, first of all, off the bat, I want to talk to you about something. Have you seen this UFO stuff? At have. Congress, yeah. yeah so, yeah. Um, former intelligence officer David mm. Grush, he went in front of um, Congress um, this week, 
and he's a whistleblower. He's basically revealed so much stuff that is basically completely like so. So Congress, right, have all come together. Yeah. And if you know, you know one thing about Congress, they do not like being kept out of the loop, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. this whistleblower, David Grush, has come out and he's confirmed like three major like bombshell facts, right? So the first one he's confirmed is that the government have had a multi-decade program. Um, of, of obtaining crashed UFOs. Yeah. Right? Um, the second thing he like revealed is that the, the, like, the US government have had knowledge of UFOs or UAPs or whatever you want to call them since the 1930s, right? So that's almost 100 years of knowledge of this. And then the third like massive bombshell was that when he was asked if any of the pilots were recovered from these crashed UFOs, he said yes. What did he call it? He said biologics. And then, he, th- then they, they asked him a question, were these pilots... Uh, human or non-human and he said non-human biologics that's Can crazy you believe that and then they pressed him more and he said i can't i can't reveal any more than that mm. but what i can tell you is that what what i've seen was truly deeply disturbing that's wild obviously Mate. it would be disturbing if it's something that's extraterrestrial non-human like this is this is crazy and the a lot of people have said oh no we've, we've seen whistleblowers come out before and say things like this right and it's always the same sort of people saying, oh, this guy's just trying to sell a book or just trying to get attention, right? Actually think about it, right? You're an intelligence officer and you're revealing these government secrets, right? What intention has he got to lie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's True. zero intention to lie whatsoever, right? And what people don't understand, right, is that laws are being passed as a result of this hearing this week. What laws? So like, for example, there's going to be way more... Um, there's going to be a lot more like protections against whistleblowers. So before like the whistleblowers, you know, they're scared for their life. They mm. can get like their careers can be ruined. So there's going to be more protections for whistleblowers. And also the, the Congress have voted that um, they passed legislation that the federal government have to be way more transparent with the, um, the dealings of UFOs. Mm. Like this is, I, th- I honestly think this is a massive turning point in like UFOs um, going forward. But do you think we'll hear more? I think so. I think more more stuff will come out, and I think more whistleblowers will come forward as a result of David Grush. Are you like? I just kind of feel like this stuff was already like known, almost like all of the stuff that's like happened, all the famous UFO sightings and whatever. There's so many like convincing stories. I'm just going to pull up one now no, that you might it. have heard of. Um, so it was this really. Was it? No, it wasn't that. I forgot where it was. Was it? Was it? It wasn't the Roswell incident. That's the really famous. Roswell one. was in the fifties. Yeah, yeah. So that was. Wait, but there was oh, wait. There was a guy. There was like a, a an official. Is this recently? No, it was years ago. But there's but yeah, there's been so many whistleblowers coming out. But I think now with like more UFOs being sighted than usual, obviously everyone's got smartphones with them now. I think these sightings are getting more and more common. And I think the amount of whistleblowers that are going to come forward is going to increase big time. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to, we'll have to see, man. I don't know. There's a lot. Oh, okay. That's the one. That's the one. That's the one. Okay. I think it was in Brazil. So the Roswell incident, was that in New Mexico or Mexico? Yeah. New Mexico, I think. Okay. So I'm just going to whip it up because this one's very interesting. Oh, it was. Okay. So basically in 1996, Apparently, it was residents of um, this area in Brazil that claimed to see one or more strange creatures and at least one unidentified flying object, right? So, apparently, another association, um, associ- there's other s- associated claims that basically include the capture of one or more of these extraterrestrial beings by the Brazilian authorities. Um, there was also animal fatalities at a zoo. And apparently a woman Shit. who was impregnated by extraterrestrial kid, that's garbage. Um, but I forgot what it was, but basically, apparently there was this one guy who was like an army official. He basically, um, I think there was like a girl who was like knocked unconscious or something by like the UFO or rather he touched like an object that was from like an extraterrestrial thing. Apparently he died. Like two or three days later, because he touched the, the UFO, completely unknown causes. Really, like yeah, Fuck. and it was just because he was exposed to this like extraterrestrial shit. So I feel like stuff like that is super compelling. Oh my, yeah, honestly, like 
and the stuff like i mean I, i've only sort of given like the main highlights there but some yeah. of the stuff he was saying was like the stuff that he's seen and the stuff that they've acknowledged like defies the laws of physics like yeah. this is like this is huge and the fact that like congress are now like republicans and democrats are literally joining forces to like make ufo sightings and make reporting of it like more transparent and get the federal government to like reveal more secrets and stop being so closed about it i think this is a big turning point in, i think um, the best thing about that happening is that there's going to be less incentive for people to lie about claiming there's ufos because if it's going to become a more of a common occurrence where actually it's now recognized people aren't going to get the same like the same attention that they once did by talking about ufo sightings exactly so now it's almost giving more reason to legitimize it and like look i i i i believe in it oh 100 percent. yeah like i've like they can't all be bollocks, can they? No, definitely not. And it's like, with, with, if you think about the level of technology that we've got now as like the human race, why is there such thing as a UFO? Like, we should be able to know exactly what the fuck that is. Yeah. And if we can't, what's the next exp explanation? Oh, it's beyond our laws of physics and understanding. And yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why we can't identify it. Yeah. No, exactly. Um, but yeah, it's exciting. I'm, I'm excited. I hope more whistleblowers come out. I want, I want, I want confirmation of aliens. I want to see what they fucking look like. Was yeah. it was it David Grush who said that like the technology is something like fifty thousand years ahead of ours? You might have done. I'm not too sure about that. It's not for hours. They, uh, years, yeah, years, years, yeah. years, years. Um, Wouldn't be surprised. I mean, if they can get here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I mean, it's it's crazy, really. Like when you think about it, like the earliest civilizations of humanity didn't develop until it was between four thousand and three thousand BC, right? So if you think 50,000 isn't a lot, it's not in the grand scheme of time, but that is so far advanced. That's crazy, it's beyond yeah. comprehension to the point of being beyond comprehension. It's and that's why they're UFOs, because we're like, we don't understand it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't yeah. understand how, how it can be here. No, exactly. But yeah, man, I'm excited to see what happens. I just hope, I just hope that like the world doesn't decide. Because I know one thing Grush said, is like a big part of their work or someone else on Grush's side said a big part of their work is determining friend from foe. Listen, right. if aliens are here or coming here and there's UFOs that are coming to the earth, yeah, no way they're like enemies and trying to hurt us. Well, they, would have, they would have wiped us exactly. out by now. Exactly. Yeah. No chance. And if we try and declare war on them, they will just wipe us out. Just leave it, man. I think they're just chilling, man. They're just watching from above and be like, yo, season 20 of Earth is lit, bro. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Realistically. Yeah. For all we know, like, I don't know. They could just be refreshing each time. I don't know. They're loving yeah. it, man. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. we're basically their Netflix, you know? Facts, man. There's so much drama on this earth. So much drama. That's the yeah. thing. <laughs> These intelligent beings have definitely figured out a way to live in harmony. Honestly, we have given them content. <laughs> <laughs> we have given them such incredible content, yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. Imagine, bro. Honestly. Yeah. But yeah, if there are any like aliens watching and stuff, just know, listen, me and Rory are on your side. Yeah, like, mate, hit facts. us up. Do you know what? Let's get them on the pod. <laughs> We're getting them on the pod. Yeah, yeah, yeah. come on, man. Honestly, yeah, yeah, yeah. we'd love it. But no, um, very interesting. Let's yeah. see what happens. 100%. But yeah, um, but yeah, on a slightly different note. Um, very different note. Very different note. I went to, um, to watch Barbie Bro. this week. Like, I've got something to say after we go ahead. But like, just first of all, I want to say like, I went to Wandsworth Cinema, Cineworld. And I go to the cinema a lot, all the time. Wandsworth Cine World is always dead. Like yeah. no one's there. Like maximum ten people in the cinema, right? Yeah. I have never seen it more packed in my entire life. And this wasn't even opening weekend. This was like Tuesday, like the Tuesday, like it released on the Friday before. Like it was heaving, right? Mm. In the cinema, in the cinema I was in, every single seat was taken up. Wow. People were coming in dressed as pink. Like people were like, like it was actually really nice to see. Like especially like with all the flops we've talked about recently, like. The, the discourse around cinema has been it's dying right it's i've not since star wars the force awakens came out in 2015 have i seen like this much buzz and this much like people dressing up and getting involved in the cinema again and actually as a big fan of cinema and i want the cinemas to survive it was it made me happy like it was great to see um but yeah as for like and obviously as for like the box office and stuff yeah dude this film has made bank bro yeah, it has cool. made so much so a little stat for you right so it's made in six days it's made half a billion dollars Fucking hell. right so this so barbie in six days has made more than the flash shazam 2 
in their entire domestic run combined. Fuck it. Oh. Just to like, that's crazy that's if you crazy. think about it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's doing really, really well. As for the film itself, I've got I've got thoughts. Go on, right? hit me with that. So, okay, first of all, like the film, like the best part of the film is production design. Like it is crazy. The like the, the pink buildings, like everything sort of looks doll like, but it's like the, the attention to detail is so so good. Um, is that CGI or is that no no? Set? Like that's they actually build they build wow. sets. Yeah yeah. Um, so like that sort of side of it is incredible. The soundtrack banging, bro. Okay. <laughs> but like, dude, Tame and Parlor just like I was what? Like, Tame and Parlor was watching. It? I was like. That's fucking Taylor <laughs> Parlor. No right, it's so good. Yeah, like the, the 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 soundtrack is incredible. Um, and also like for me, like the the best part of the film is just the humor. Like mm. this is the most I've laughed in a film in a long, long time. Like, okay, it was, fine. Uh, it was absolutely hilarious. Like it and it's the tone of it is very self aware and meta. Like it knows how ridiculous and it knows how campy the idea of Barbie is, and it sort of plays with the our preconceived notions of what Barbie is and what it means to girls and society. Um, and it was just, honestly, laugh out loud funny. The standout of this film, Ryan Gosling as Ken. Yeah. Fucking okay, stole the show. He, honestly, like, every time he was on screen, I la laughed every time. Like, really? he, he, it's like he took this role and he just threw himself into it. Oh, like, fine, yeah. he absolutely, became uh, he became Ken. And you could just tell, like, you know when you're watching a film, and this this cast is stacked, by the way. Yeah, like, I know. It's huge. Like uh, the people rocked up, and I was like, I had no idea you were in this film. Like, yeah, Dua Lipa just shows up at one point. I was like, what? No way. Um, well, I actually knew about that. To be fair, but like everyone was, it was crazy. Who else was in? Give us some big names. Like, um, Rob Brydon was randomly in this film. Like, showed up out of nowhere. Um, Will Ferrell's in this film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like I don't want to spoil. There are a few other ones, but I don't want to. Like, okay, you should watch fine. it. Um, and yeah, so this cast is stacked, right? But. You can just tell watching it, everyone had so much fun making this film. Yeah. Like you can just tell off the screen like how much fun people are having with it. Um, so yeah, so for me, like the first half of it, when it's very meta, it's very self-aware and it's sort of like almost poking fun at itself. That's when the, the, it really worked for me. My biggest issue with this film is it goes for like social commentary, right? And obviously it's a Barbie film. It's going to be about like feminism. And I've got no problem with the message of the film whatsoever. My problem with it is how it delivers that message, right? This film on multiple points stops and it just whacks the viewer over the head being like, this is the message of the film. It, like, do you know, it's like so direct and so on the nose. It just took me out completely. Uh, okay, yeah. Especially when you've got like quite a, like this film started, it's smart, it's witty, it's self-aware, it's meta. And then every time it just, you know, a character does a big monologue about like the patriarchy and it's just, I get that, but there's way, like way more clever ways to do it, do that. And it just felt like this, it's that classic thing, right? Like show don't tell. The second half of this film does a lot of telling the social message over and over again. So for me, that was like the biggest like problem with it where sometimes I'm like, oh, this is actually like a really smart script. And sometimes I'm like, oh, that just feels a little bit clumsy and could have been handled better. Um, but overall, I think it's a great film. And you know what? It's not a film for kids at all. Mm. Like some of the jokes in this, there is like proper innuendos and stuff. Um, it's, but no, it's really, really good. It's a fun time. Laughed a lot. Like the energy in the cinema was really, really great. Um, also, speaking of a stacked cast, three sex education cast cast members are in this. I'm guessing. I know that. Uh, what's her name? Emma. Emma Mackey. Um, Shooty's in it. Who plays um, Eric? Yeah, sick. Yeah. Um, and then um, who's the Eric's boyfriend? Adam. Adam. Yeah, Adam's in no it. Way. Yeah, yeah, he's in it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he's in it as well. Stacked but there's, honestly, there are some like really funny like running gags. So like, I think if you're like, I mean, I never owned a Barbie when I was a kid, but if you're like a fan of Barbie, I think they go for like some really deep cuts. So like there are like, they reference like these weird Barbies. So for example, in the beginning of the film, like there's pregnant Barbie and they're like, Oh Jesus, I thought she was discontinued. Get her away. Like, oh, do you know what I mean? They're like yeah, poke yeah, fun yeah. and stuff. And then like, there's like weird Barbie who's like, who's been played with too hard in the real world. Who's like got, you know, crayon all over her face and messed up hair and is constantly doing the splits. And it's like, it's just absolutely bonkers. Um, but yeah, the film is at its best when it's like, knows what it is. And it's just going for the ridiculous and going for the camp. And it just falls apart a little bit when it's like whacking you over the head with its social message. Worth seeing? Uh, do you know what? I'd say, yeah, it's a fun time. If you just go in with an open mind and, you know, it's just it embrace the ridiculousness of it all, I think you'll have a good time. I, I, I do want to. Yeah. Also, it's such a big pop culture moment at the moment. It's like, 
you may as well just go and make the most of it, right? Facts. And, and I, don't, I think watching this at home would not no one be near as good. Okay, you want to watch it with an audience who are laughing along with it, I think. I think so. That, yeah. that does make stuff more funny. It does, 100%. I think a lot of the jokes, actually, I wouldn't have like laughed out loud at. Um, if people weren't laughing around you. Oh, well, it's just that thing is, it's like going to a stand-up comedy night is so much better than watching it at home. Yeah. Like, bro, it's yeah. the reason that like sitcoms used to have like laugh applause tracks. Like, yeah, exactly. It's all like encourages you to laugh. So yeah, definitely one to watch on the big screen. Um, but yeah, overall, I had a really fun time with it. Like, I would recommend it. Like, tick all the boxes. But yeah, just some some stuff which I think could have done with a few rewrites. I'm, I, but I'm sure that was intentional because you can't be the first person to point it out. Uh, what the social message stuff yeah really. you yeah oh yeah no no it was, it was intentional it was just like the way they delivered it just didn't quite work for me yeah. fine fair enough yeah, fair yeah. enough fair enough man um but yeah i would i do want to go see it but speaking of films man there's something i wanted to talk about which might seem completely irrelevant but actually i guess you could also say it's um along the feminist movement kind of thing okay i wanted to talk about a film that means a lot to me it means a lot to a lot of people. So, bro, do you remember the film Bend It Like Beckham? Yes. Yeah. I love that film. Yeah. Keira right. Knightley, right? Keira Knightley yeah, is yeah, in it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, banging film. Banging film. Um, so, basically, the reason I'm bringing it up is because I recently saw an interview with the director, Gorinda Chad. And okay. it was, you know, because the film is like so old, she was kind of revisiting it. The film came out in 2002, yeah. That long ago. Bro, do you remember what the film's about? Vaguely. Yeah, so basically... Female football players, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spot, yeah. So it's about two girls, just Minda and Jules, who basically chase careers to be professional footballers. Yeah. Um, then you've got just just Minda. She basically... Um, I think her nickname was Jess, isn't it? Uh, but yes, they basically... She comes from an Indian household. Her friend Jules is like playing for a football team. They're both sick at football. She ends up joining Jules' football team and then they go and like chase this career in football. But... I don't know, man. It was just like, I just, just deep it, deep it in the context of its time. Because honestly, that film was so ahead of its time. 100%. Let's talk about some of the things that it kind of covers. So firstly, it's talking about, it's a football film, yeah? That's kind of the core of it. It's a football film, but it was starring two girls rather than blokes, right? And it still ended up winning an award for sports film of the year. Did it? Yeah. Interesting. I think at the time it was the highest grossing film about football. Wow, that's yeah. that's crazy. Yeah, with with, Shit. with with like, and it was about women rather than men's football. Yeah, and obviously, as we know, there's a huge, huge debate that's been constantly going on, kind of throughout our lifetimes. Really, it's about like equal pay between men and women in sports, especially football, right? So that was like a huge, huge thing that it's about that, right? Secondly, it's about the themes of like the LGBTQ plus community. You've got just Are the two girls lesbians. They're not. No, they're, they're not. They're, they're like. Jules's I've not seen it a long. I have is. seen it, but I saw it probably fifteen years ago. No, so. Yeah, they're not. Jules's mum thinks they are. Oh, because they're playing. Yeah, because yeah, uh, they like spend yeah. a lot of time together. Yeah, yeah, and, like yeah. she misheard one of the conversations. But actually, uh, Jasminda, she has a um, she has a friend who's gay, and her parents think like he's into her, but he's not because he's gay. Obviously, like yeah, yeah. yeah. But. Um, so yeah, so it covers that as well, which is super ahead of its time again to have like a, a gay kind of, um, you know, not even like a side character or like um, someone in the background. He's a full, he's, he's an antagonist. I wouldn't say he's a protagonist, but still he's very much involved. And then finally, it's about an Asian family, but more so it paints a completely different light of Asians in like media at the time compared to like everything mm. else and it's a struggle that was still going on throughout my childhood to be honest right into like my teen years of like asian specifically like indians being completely misrepresented um completely misrepresented in like film tv everything i'm gonna give you some examples of that right apu from the simpsons yep. yeah 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 big yeah rajesh kuthrapali from the big bang theory yeah, 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 and then you've got Baljeet from Phineas and Ferb. Mm. Like we're not all nerds. Yeah, yeah, we're not all like just owning corner shops and you know stuff like that. And we're not all yeah, basically just losers. I mean, Rajesh Kuthapali is literally such a loser in the Big Bang Theory that he can't even speak to women. I mean, think about that. You've picked the Indian character to be to, to not be to, able to speak to, to, to women. To not be, like think about the 
the impact that yeah. that has. And on TikTok now, all you see, you see loads of videos of people going around and they're, there's guys who go round to girls and say, oh, what race wouldn't you date? And you'd be surprised the amount of times they say, like, Indians. Really? Yeah. That's and so bad. Why? It's obviously because of the way that media has represented us. Yeah. It's been a big problem. And I'm going to come back onto that in a second. But I just wanted to speak really, really briefly about Gorinda Chad, because I really think, like, she's got an amazing story from what she kind of came from and how she dedicated herself to really just going down the path less travelled by. Right. So she was born in Kenya and she came to the UK as a child when she was two years old, moved to Southall, which, as some people may know, or some people may not. It's like a huge hub for like Indians in London. Um, so, yeah. So her father basically faced discrimination as well. As soon as she moved over, he used to be a clerical worker in Barclays Bank in Kenya. He went into a Barclays Bank in the UK and wanted the same job. And they literally laughed in his face. They're really? like, there's no fucking chance you're going to be able to get a job working here. Like, speaking like that with the turban, with the beard, like, wow. not going to happen. Oh, yeah, he had a turban and a beard. Um, so she was, um, she's Sikh. Um, so he ended up opening a shop just to basically keep the economic stability at home for his family. So she then also stood up against some cultural oppressions within Indian culture. Indian culture is very um, patriarchal. Uh, so for example a lot of the time in the culture especially traditionally it was like women are at home like make like cooking in the kitchen yeah. and essentially like serving the men that's kind of like a part of it she refused to cook for her father and the guys in her really? family yeah she refused she's like i'm not gonna fucking do Good that on her <laughs> yeah she refused to wear indian clothing despite being a first generation um like immigrant into the country so she stood up against that she also faced sexism uh in her school she wanted to go to university i think she wanted to go to the university of east anglia to study she really liked geography so she wanted to do something geography related i think the course was i've got it written down what was it it should something to do with like geography and economics um studying political polit politics and developmental economics at the university of east anglia she went to her careers advisor to discuss that with her to, um, to, sorry to discuss that with her careers advisor careers advisor laughed in her face and said wow. you should do a secretarial degree at some lesser university jesus christ yeah man. yeah yeah exactly so she fully just had to face all of this oppression growing up and she stood against it she went ended up going to the university of east anglia to study that qualification she then got a job for the bbc as a news reporter initially which is amazing because i think she then went on to study journalism and she went on to direct i think she directed eight full feature films wow um a few short films and a couple documentaries as well and she went and won best sports movie espy in 2003 Damn. for bend it like beckham and then she also won a glamour award filmmaker so Honestly, this film that she made, Bend It Like Beckham, and all the films she made, she also made Bride and Prejudice, and I think she made, uh, what was it? I think it was Bargy on the Beach. Sorry, she made Bride and Pride and Prejudice. Pri Bride, Bride and Prejudice. Bride, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, honestly, she just did so much for the culture, and it really means a lot, because, as I mentioned before, when you're growing up, being Indian, and seeing the way that you're being portrayed on TV and film you can then see the direct correlation of that in the people you're meeting. Mm. Like, I, I wouldn't say I ever experienced racism, but certainly microaggressions of like, you know, I had like a, I once approached a girl and I fully had a girl tell me, sorry, I don't go for Indians. That's like, why, why, why? Like, I, like, do you know what I mean? Like to me, that just didn't make sense. That's crazy. And it, it just sucked. But, you know, her being able to make a film that portrayed Indians in such a cool way, like, Jasminda is, is a fucking icon for all of us, really, especially when we're younger. And it's a shame that it was like one of the only films at the time that did that. But then, as I've got older, things have got like a lot better. Indians are way more, you know, integrated into like films. Um, what was that? What's that Netflix series? That Never have I ever. Yeah, that yeah, portrayed yeah. as um the Tamil actress. That's done really, really well for the Asian community mm -hmm. and South Asian community, which is great. So we're seeing a lot more of us. There's someone who went to my school, Rish Shah. He's gone on to be in, I think he was in Never Have I Ever as well. Oh, really nice. He was also in, he was in, 
it's Miss Marvel. The oh, Miss Marvel, she yeah, was in yeah. Miss Marvel, sorry, not yeah. Never Have I Ever. She was in Miss Marvel. First also, Muslim superhero on they, screen. There you go. Yeah. So he was in that film. Amazing. Uh, in that series. And he was, so like, people like that, that's just doing like amazing things for us. But there's something really else that I really wanted to talk about, right? And it was just basically just about this huge Asian subculture that used to exist back in the, I think it was the 80s and the 90s, basically. So Indians, like the way media's re represented Indians has just basically portrayed, okay, maybe some element of truth, but it's completely misrepresented the culture and especially those who kind of moved to the country maybe in the 60s, 70s, 80s. And yeah, basically there was like, a lot of people don't know this. There used to be this huge underground South Asian kind of raving culture. Really? That used to exist. No way. And there's a company out there which currently represents something that's a core part of the history of the UK raving scene called Daytimers. Back in the 80s and 90s, you used to have kids and, you know, young adults, and they used to go raving, man. They used to go raving. They used to listen to, like, Indian music and, like, garage and, nice. like, everything else you can think of. And it was called Daytimers because they had strict parents that gave them strict curfews. They used to go raving during the day. No way. So they, they could be back, back for 10 o'clock. They could be back for whenever their curfew wow. was. Wow. And it was a huge movement in the UK. So these would literally happen in the middle of the day. And it was like our rebellion, basically, as Asians. Like, this is how, what we used to do. We're fucking cool. Do you know what I mean? Mm. You can't just put all Asians in one box because of Rajesh Kuthrapoli. Nah. We're representing people out here. We're doing, like, cool shit. We just had to find different ways to do it. But regardless, you know, that's why it, it really irks me at these characters because that's what I was then led to believe as I got older. You internalise that. 100%. What you see in the media or what you hear, like you end up like as a young kid, impressionable kid, you end up internalising that and you think, oh, well, maybe all I can do is work in a corner shop, be a doctor. Like, do you know what I mean? It's, and, yeah. Bro, I just used to drastically think like, it, this art, oh, like this is the way that Asians are. Like, we, we aren't cool. Do you know what I mean? And that sucked. And then I learned all about this kind of ob subculture. That's so cool. I, I had no idea about that. That's so Gaminda, cool. Gorinda, is it still still going? Yeah, daytime is it still going. Is it? Not, it's not the same movement. Obviously, yeah. times have changed. And like, we're now talking about second, third gens, um, generation who have been in the who country. Who now probably don't, maybe don't have curfews. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like the rave, the rave yeah. still happen. I've been to one. They still happen. Uh, there was a guy to, who went to our uni who was a, in our year. He was, oh, really? was a DJ for oh, daytimers. And uh, yeah, yeah, so the rave still happening at night. Sick. But yeah, man, Daytimers was huge. And then you've got like DJ Radical Sister and you've got DJ Ritu, who are big DJs now. Uh, they've made a really big name for themselves. They used to DJ at Daytimers. So that's another cool thing about Daytimers. Even though it had, um, like Indians had have like a very uh, patriarchal, like it's very patriarchal society traditionally. Daytimers used to see female DJs. That's go up, cool. which in the 80s and 90s in like th that's huge you know what i mean that's so huge but um but yeah man I, that, apologies i went on such a big tangent but it just means a lot to me and i wanted to express that that was i loved that Thanks, that man. was really I, yeah really hey, that's i did, didn't knew any of that the day timers didn't know about that the, the director like and we, you know putting it like that that bend it like back was so ahead of its time so ahead of its time and you know what after hearing that in, like especially with how big female football is now like it's so much but people actually watch it now yeah like they need to make a sequel they need to make a they sequel. need to make a sequel asap because like it that that yeah when you're hearing it like that it, that it sounds so ahead of its time let's do it mom we'll make it we'll make it we'll, we'll write it, it and yeah, then submit yeah, yeah. it yeah <laughs> now nah, but honestly if anyone happens to be watching this please send this to Gorinda chad i'd love to see i'd love to see a sequel and also i just love for her to know how much she means to me for creating that yeah. film that's yeah that's inspiring um but yeah man uh anyway moving on swiftly yeah, moving on um bro, it's, there was yeah. two albums that recently came out yes um so first one let's do this morning actually when i was at the gym uh so utopia travis scott honestly it might be too early to say <laughs> it's a classic <laughs> It's a classic, <laughs> but it's, it was classic. bro. Like Wasn't thirty it, seconds in, I was like, "It's a classic." No, it's listen. I like I. I loved Astro World. I loved Rodeo. 
Um, like, I think Travis Scott's recent run of features, I think, has been a little bit lacking. It's just, you, you can just tell he's not putting any effort in. After hearing this album, you can tell he puts all his effort into his albums. Like, it is, it is honestly... And do you know what I love about it? This doesn't just sound like another Astro World. Like the sounds and stuff that you're hearing, completely different, unlike anything I've heard before. Mm. Do you know, you know, when you're listening to a song, like the one I'm thinking of is God's Country. Just hearing it, it's like, which actually, so God's Country, which is one of my favorite tracks on this album, it's a, it's a, it's a Kanye West throwaway. Oh, really? So those two songs. I like that so, song a lot. So God's Country and um, Telekinesis, right? Yeah. They're, they were both originally supposed to be on the Donda album and they were recorded back in 2020. And you can actually find the originals on YouTube. So God's Country, you can find on YouTube and originally had Kanye West in and uh, Telekinesis was originally called Future Sounds. Um, and obviously that was a Kanye West song, but he ended up dropping it. Um, I'm so happy that these two made it into this album because they are absolute bangers and probably two of my standouts um, of the album. Um, but yeah, my, my general thoughts of this album is that I think this is the Yeezus of Travis Scott's discography. So for context, when Yeezus came out, it was this weird, experimental, out there, kind of dark, kind of like, do you know what I mean? Rough around the edges. Like this to me feels like that. Okay. If Astro World was the graduation, it kind of like, you know, catapulted Travis Scott into the mainstream. This one is like, He's just going for different sounds that he's never, ever done before. Like, honestly. And, and do you know what the best part about Travis Scott albums are? He doesn't put the features in the song title. So you, like, you listen to it for the first time. And then suddenly when, like, you hear Drake come out, it just comes out of nowhere. And it's just, wait, and you're wait, just wait, like, which song ah! is Drake on again? Um, I think it's called, uh, bear with me a sec. Hang on. Because I, I think, it, I think it, he is in. Is I think it's meltdown. meltdown. Meltdown, yeah. Was so he's meltdown in, or sirens. I'm no, sure. uh, uh, was Lil Wayne on one of? As no, well? Lil Wayne. I don't think he's in it. But, but Drake yeah, was. I think. It was, yeah, meltdown. Think, yeah, 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 yeah. So he's yeah. in that. Um, and like, I tell you what, another one, another standout one for me is is um, Circus Maximus when the weekend comes in at the end. Like, oh, honestly, like, the, I think the album's great. And every time I've listened, I've listened to it twice now. It's oh, getting better and better. But yeah, I love. I wish more artists did that, like not including the featuring, because then when it when they do come, it feels like when you're at a concert and the act brings out a surprise guest. It, that's genuinely what it feels like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's like you sort of stop what you're doing. Like, oh shit! It's you know, I'm not, yeah. It's overall absolutely loving the album, and um, it kind of feels like a cohesive sound he's gone for mm. and a cohesive vibe. Whereas a lot of albums um, kind of feel like a playlist, you know, and it's like we'll make all these songs and then we'll just chuck them in a thing and release it. This feels like if, if, if he made a song that didn't fit the aesthetic of this album, it wasn't included. Mm. Like, and it just, it feels dark. Like if Astro World was, you know, felt like an acid trip in the theme park at the daytime, this feels like an acid trip at nighttime. Do you know what I mean? It's that kind of like dark grungy vibe. Um, but yeah, absolutely love this album. I'm excited to hear it, listen to it again. Wow. Um, it's, it's really good. Honestly, I know you've listened to a few songs, put your earphones in, sit, just listen to it and it's like also he sounds hungry again like he's he's actually rapping his ass off here and like the production's insane um and yeah and he's just i love how he's not rehashed old sounds and he's just gone for something different um but yeah also you know you know he was going to originally going to be doing a concert at the pyramids did you see so his oh my god i saw that yeah his yeah, his, yeah. his his launch party was going to be in cairo by the pyramids last minute like 2 days before it was about to start um got cancelled why? Because apparently there was like production issues or something like that. But he's come out and said it's still going to happen. It just won't be on launch day of, of Utopia. Is... People have already bought tickets. But can you imagine? Yeah, I want to go. <laughs> imagine fucking listening to Travis Scott just by the pyramids. fucking pyramids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it would be when insane. You pyramids, it took me a while to like try and comprehend. Yeah, yeah. What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? Pyramids, I remember seeing yeah. that. No, bro, let's go. That would be insane. I would. I'd honestly give my left testicle to go to that. Like, I would honestly like. <laughs> like how much would you pay to go? Pyramids, Travis Scott. Things you're going to the pyramids as well. Okay, e and I'd have to buy my own flights to Egypt. Mm, yeah. Um, oh, I'd probably make a trip out of it though. Yeah, yeah of course. Same, Go same, see same, the Nile, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. the kings. We're talking just for a ticket. Uh, I would pay seven hundred. 
Okay, fine. That's that's reasonable. I think I, think reasonable. I paid seven hundred because it's like it's not just a concert. I I I'm, I usually wouldn't pay like anywhere near that for to see anyone, but I think going to an open air concert by, by the, the pyramid, pyramid that's like that's an unforgettable you remember, experience if you can remember if, I would pay that much because it would be an event that you would remember for the rest of 100%. your life 100% and the thing is no other artist can do it after him because everyone's just going to be like oh you copy Travis exactly and I, I actually think that would be if, if he does end up doing this concert that will be a moment in music history oh, of and course to, it will to be like I was there yeah that's yeah oh, oh, come on fact do you know what I'd pay a grand <laughs> <laughs> I'm up in the numbers yeah yeah, yeah fact listen yeah. it depends how up my money is right now I'd pay a grand <laughs> right, let's say the when the podcast blows, I can't afford a grand. Got a bit more, a bit more <laughs> yeah. keys in my pocket. I'd go, bro. Listen, let's get the money up, and then I'll pay anything yeah. they want, bro. I'm, I'm, I mean, I want to be there. Yeah, but yeah, man. <laughs> nah, sick. Um, okay, cool. On music, then, bro. Do you remember a couple of weeks ago we did the uh, the music game? Oh fucking hell! Here we go. You won it last time. What are you did saying? Did I win it last time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But are we go. Are we going with the next letter? Will it? Yeah. C. Yeah, and B. 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 We've done B. We did A. No, we've done B as well. We haven't. Did we not? No, no, no. Okay, okay. Okay, you so, me? ready. Name a musical artist. The, oh, sorry. Let's... How am I even going to start this? Name a musical artist beginning with B. Back to back. Let's go. Start. B. Uh, B-I-A. Okay. Uh, Beyonce. Ben Howard. Bad Bunny. Bass. The Rapper. Still, that car, burner boy, fuck, um, fuck, I'm done. You done? But I just got blood blank, bro. Oh my god, whoa, um, fuck. Got a few more in the bank. Got B fifty twos, um. I don't know if we could class like class the. You definitely prep this. I did prep. I did you prep. definitely. I I, you gotta give me a chance. I did prep. Dude, uh, it's so yeah. hard when you haven't thought about it. Bastille came off the Bastille, dome. You got that from Bass. Yeah, 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 that was a good. Yeah, that was a good recovery there. Yeah. I like that. I like that. <laughs> um, and then yeah, yeah, these fifty twos. Who else? There's loads, man. There's um. I've run out. Now. It's really hard, isn't it? You just yeah, sort of yeah, freeze. Yeah. I'm trying to think of like different like genre, what like. Let me work out. Bark. Bark. <laughs> Beethoven. Fuck Beethoven, bro. Um, and then, who else? I'm just going to look at my artists. Who have I got? I don't even know, man. There's loads. There's loads. But yeah, if we've missed any obvious ones, let us know in the comments. Uh, and we're going to do, what do you see at some point? Which I'm looking forward to. B.O.B. <laughs> uh, yeah. B.B. King. B.B. King. Oh, oh fuck. B.B. King. Fuck, I'm so annoyed at myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, guys, so yeah, let us know in the comments if we missed any any obvious ones. But um, yeah, man. Cool. Uh, cool. Wrap so, there was an interesting backstory I wanted to give you, if yeah. that's all right. Okay, cool. So, this is something that I kind of had known about, but I just wanted to tell you about it because I think it is really, really cool. So, do you like KFC? I love KF. Okay, fine. <laughs> Fine, fine, fine. So I can't lie, I've gone off it recently, actually. Why? Because I just don't think it's like all that. Like I used to love the hot wings. I just think I can get better ones at like Morley's, for example. To be completely honest. The zinger burger. You don't fuck with the zinger burger. I'll fuck with the zinger burger, but what again, the, I just feel the... like my local chicken shop. Okay, what about the, the OG pieces though? Yeah, okay, yeah. Original yeah, yeah, recipe. Yeah, yeah. Come on, juicy no, I'll, get, I'll give you that. The OG the pieces. Yeah, they're juicy. And that gravy. That gravy! I don't, I don't know what the fuck's in that. It could be crack, it but I'm crack, here for it. I mean, it it's so crack. good. It's literally just like the congealed like bone marrow. I saw, I crack. actually once saw a video of them making the gravy and they basically sweep all the excess shit <laughs> off the chicken and they put it into like a grinder. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, to this yeah, day, yeah. I still have gravy every time. <laughs> it's okay, so got, good. Do you, do you drink gravy after? Of course I feel yeah, like the gravy. Fuck. I'd be but, sipping that shit, yeah, right? Yeah, but, if, if people are looking, I'll try to do it discreetly. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it comes out hot as well. They call man. it the sip of shame. <laughs> it is the sip of shame. But yeah, man. Anyway, so KFC. Do you know, obviously you all know, it was founded by Colonel Sanders. He's the face of the logo. But do you know the story about Colonel Sanders? No. Okay. So this is really, really interesting. And when I found out about it, I was like, God damn, this is fascinating. So Colonel Sanders was born in 1890 and he had a very tough life. Very tough life. So I'm going to give a brief rundown, right? 
Colonel Sanders, born in 1890, right? His dad passed away when he was just six years old, leaving him to basically cook for the rest of his siblings. He dropped out of school when he was in the seventh grade to go and work as a farmhand. At the age of 16, he lied about his age and decided to enlist in the army until the next year where he was honorably discharged. He then got hired as a laborer at a railway. However, when he was working at the, sorry, yeah, whilst he was working at the railway, he was also studying law, but he fucked up his law degree because he got into a fight. So he then basically, and I think that he then lost his job at the um, railway as well. He then had to move back in with his mum where he decided to start selling life insurance. But unfortunately, he got fired for insubordination. In 1920, now at the age of 30, he founded a ferry boat company and he tried to basically cash this company in to create a lamp manufacturing company. But he found out there was another company that was selling a better version of his lamps. So that didn't work. At the age of 40, he started selling chicken (laughs) in a gas station. But as he began to advertise his food, he had an argument with a competitor, which ended up in a shootout. Fucking hell. He then rebuilt and ran a new motel where he was also had a restaurant where he was selling chicken that unfortunately had to close down because of World War II. After the war, he tried to franchise his restaurant. Um, his recipe was actually rejected over 1,000 times before anyone accepted it. So he had a secret recipe, which was then coined Kentucky Fried Chicken, and it was a hit in 1952 when he was like 62 years old. But the restaurant that he had, which was popping, basically had to close down because an interstate opened up kind of around the corner. After this, he traveled across the US um, and he was basically cooking batches of chicken from restaurant to restaurant where he was basically making a deal with restaurants where he was earning like a nickel for each piece of chicken that he then sold. And uh, yeah, so then in 1964, he finally kind of opened up enough restaurants. He franchised with over 600 franchised outlets. And then he sold his interest in the company for 2 million US dollars to a group of investors, which at now would be about 15, 16 million US Damn, dollars. Got the bag. So to clarify, Colonel Sanders went through shit in his life. He had failure after failure after failure. And it wasn't until he was in his 60s, literally going restaurant to restaurant, essentially door to door, selling his chicken, that he made it. That's crazy. Yeah. That's why. Never give up, kids. That's why he's, that's why in the logo, he looks like an old man. old as fuck, yeah. He really was an old man. Shit. He really was an old man. That's mad. Facts. Yeah. Damn. Interesting. Did not know that. There you go. It's a good point. I always thought like, why does he look so old? Why did they? Do you know what I mean? Like, did they rebrand when he turned sixty? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Damn. There you go, man. There you go. But that was a little insight, and uh, hopefully, we'll do some more. Guys, if there's any celebrities who you think we should talk about or famous people with interesting stories, let us know because 100%. honestly, we love talking about this stuff and learning something new. I feel like I've learned a lot this episode. Yeah, yeah, I've learned a lot. Yeah, you, you know, it's a lot of facts. Love it. But yeah, guys, thank you very much for li- listening. I think we'll wrap it up there. Yeah. Um, if you if you like this video, please like and subscribe, comment, um, follow us on Spotify, um, follow us on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And for that short form content, you can follow us on TikTok. You can follow us on Instagram at Larger Than Life underscore LTL Llama Tango Llama. Cheers, guys. Anyway, Thanks very much, guys. See you on the next Cheers. one. Go on, wear and